day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I will prolong. Don't worry. <laughs> reverse right. to dynamics <laughs> to catch to the not, English yeah. yes because I will try to do my best I mean it's difficult I have to th think about what I'm saying about no, 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 but the, 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 the delivery speech delivery should be speech, moderate yes. Yes. we will <laughs> catch the idea I Professor understood everything because he is in line, but some of guys. You will find it. Uh, Please sign the list, okay? And try to not move too much inside during the lecture, but pass the list because we have to give to Frederica. Thank you. Good morning. Shall we start? Shall we wait a little bit for other students? Colin. Good morning. Welcome uh, to the last day of the Winter College on Optics. I hope this time was for you a very nice time, good for learning, but also for uh, having good connection for the future, for friendships. Uh, I will uh, try today to uh, introduce, I will show you today another phase of the resolution. We had resolution in image and today we will have the resolution in time. Uh, I will uh, introduce today Professor Mikas Vengris from uh, uh, University of uh, Vilnius, Lithuania. He will give uh, two lectures about time resource spectroscopy. And when you want to uh, sh make a shorter communication on this title, you can say dynamics. And that means we can see very, very interesting things at the very low scale of time. Please, Professor. Uh, thank you, Nico. Is this on? Can you hear me? All right. Uh, well, so good morning, everyone, and uh, congratulations on uh, having made it so far. I know it was not easy, and uh, you know, if you count all the lectures that you already listened to, uh, I think uh, most of you should be brain dead by now. And uh, to finish this off with a bang, uh, we get four hours of very interesting uh, uh, talks about uh, time-resolved spectroscopy and its applications in biology and uh, physical chemistry. Uh, now, uh, I will start by uh, giving an outline of my talk. Uh, and we first start with uh, the basics. So we, we discuss the techniques and uh, the ideas that uh, developed over the past 50 years more or less uh, together with the progress in uh, the development of lasers. Uh, and uh, so uh, the advent of lasers and the invention of very short light pulses sort of opened the realm of uh, very fast processes. So that, that will be the first part of my talk. We will discuss 
fluorescence measurements with time resolution, absorption measurements with time resolution, uh, look at some applications, uh, talk about data analysis. And uh, then in the second part of my talk, we will go on to look into the more recent developments, more, uh, let's say, fresher ideas from this millennium already, and um, see how people are basically learning to let the matter, uh, so the electrons in the molecules or in solid states, dance with the clever manipulation of the laser light that is, uh, that is being shined on those, on those uh, things. All right, so uh, let me start by showing you a number of time scales and a number of devices that uh, you, uh, people use to follow these time scales. So uh, universe is about uh, 14 billion years old, and uh, so that is uh, uh, somewhere in this regime. Astronomy and development of galaxies and stars and so on takes uh, place on the... Uh, on a time scale of uh, centuries, of millennia, uh, billions of years actually. And for the, the, the closest thing that can follow this in the, uh, for, for people is a calendar. You know, you write something down on a clay uh, uh, board and leave it for the future generations to follow. And then progressively, as it is in physics, uh, uh, you have uh, this anti uh, correlation or correlation between the size of a thing and the speed with which it can move. So the smaller the thing is, the faster it moves. And uh, if you progressively go from stars to people, you already need a, a watch or a clock to time how they move. Uh, if you go to the cells and maybe to the discharge in the atmosphere, the lightnings, uh, then only a fast camera can capture the event. Now, if you are uh, entering the realm of uh, microscale, so subcellular structures, large molecules and so on, uh, the tools that can follow the events that take place uh, on a time scale of micro and nanoseconds are electronic devices. So a fast oscilloscope will give you the resolution of one gigahertz or the, the, uh, the clock in, in the processor of your mobile phone is probably one and a half gigahertz and that corresponds to uh, about one nanosecond or half a nanosecond or some, something like that. Now, the interesting bits functionally in physical chemistry and biology uh, happen on, the, on an even shorter time scale. So when you get to the molecules and uh, electrons in the molecules, the only thing that is fast enough to follow their, let's say, uh, dynamics or their, their behavior in time is light itself. So basically, you need the fastest tool available uh, that can, that can uh, address what's happening in a molecule, for example, uh, as, as it does its biological or physicochemical function. Now, and the quest for time resolution is an old one, actually. So if you look at, the, at these photographs, so there was a bet back in 19th century. People could not figure out if the feet of a horse Will, uh, when the horse is galloping, do they, uh, is there a moment when the horse is suspended in air? Do the feet leave the ground all at once? And so the guy named Mybridge set up uh, a number of uh, very fast shuttered cameras that were triggered by threads which he pulled along the track and he actually numbered the sections of the track here and took uh, sequential pictures of a galloping horse and eventually he uh, he found that in some pictures, like here, for example, or here, the horse is actually flying in there. So the eye cannot follow it, but the fast camera could. That is uh, the state of the art in the 19th century. You had to uh, take the pictures, develop the film, have enough light uh, to capture the image. And uh, so the dynamic imaging was, uh, was done uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, Mybridge. Uh, now, before him, actually, and this is uh, uh, the emblem of the Lithu uh, state of Lithuania, so it's uh, our night, uh, the horses were always drawn with uh, feet, uh, at least one of them, touching the ground. So that was wrong, and we still have it in our emblem because it's too late to change it, but uh, nevertheless. And since I'm speaking about Lithuania, I would like to uh, use the opportunity to invite every one of you who has a chance, uh, come and visit. Uh, Vilnius is a very nice city. Uh, I mean, uh, perhaps not on the scale of uh, Italian cities, but uh, most of the architecture was actually designed by Italian masters. 
Uh, and so this is the old building of the, of the university where I work. Uh, and uh, the, the, come on, the nightlife is very nice. And uh, you know, you can have, can count on having good time there. So please come and visit. Uh, we pro I promise you no more horses. But uh, the feet of the horse do leave the ground when the, go the horse is galloping, so that's something we already know. The question is, if the horse is now the size of a molecule, what do we do then? Clearly, the, the camera will not work. And uh, already, if, if you reduce the horse down to the size of a hummingbird, which is a bird the size of a big fly, basically. Well, you probably have seen it more than I have. I've only seen him once in California. If you take a picture, you cannot see the wings because they move too many times during the exposure of your camera. And uh, you, uh, only with a very fast camera that takes thousands of frames a second, you can actually take the pictures with the hummingbird suspended in flight and then use them to reconstruct precisely how the wings move uh, when the bird is flying. Now, and the childhood of the, uh, uh, of the time-resolved spectroscopy uh, was back in uh, uh, 1950s and 60s, and the Nobel Prize of 1967 was awarded for Sir George Porter for the invention of flash uh, spectrography. So basically, this, is, this was still before the invention of the lasers. Uh, 67 was after, but the work done was before. So what he did, he used photographic flashes to actually uh, start chemical reactions and then a second flash synchronized with the first one to monitor the course of, uh, of, of this uh, reaction. So it was a sort of a pump probe spectroscopy using lamps, if you want to. Now, uh, before going on, I would like to talk a bit why this is interesting. Why should we worry about the time result, the dynamic events in, in the molecules? And uh, if you take a picture, so uh, yeah, next time you fly to the moon, uh, try to take a picture of a blue marble, uh, or if you're on a satellite, you can also use your iPhone to take nice pictures of the Earth. Now, if, if, so for you, it's not, it's not surprising. We have seen this in the textbook too many times. And uh, these pictures are sort of, you know, innate. With the, uh, this is the F, we know it. But if you're an interstellar traveler made of, I don't know, silicon or superconductive helium or whatever, you know, what these uh, aliens are made of, you may wonder why here, well, it's not very visible in, uh, with a projector, but especially here, why is it so green? Why is the planet green? There are no green planets. If you look at other planets on the solar system, none of them is green. And now, so you say, let's go and investigate. So you fly down a little bit, you see that the, the you know, the planet is covered with, by some green stuff, so some green mush growing over it. You go in, you see that it's a, 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 a certain organisms that are, uh, have green color and they are abundant. They have actually changed the atmosphere of the planet. And you look at the, how they are, what they are made of. You look at the leaf. Uh, now, this is just with the eye still. Now, if you go closer and uh, look at the uh, more internal structure, now, if you're a guy looking at the microscope uh, and you see something like this on a leaf, that gives you a pause, but uh, never mind that. Uh, you, you want to look what the green uh, stuff really is. So the green stuff turns out to be this organella inside the cells called chloroplasts. And you have these pancake-like structures, and them are called thylakoids, uh, where the whole photosynthetic business is taking place. And photosynthesis is basically the, uh, the process of capturing sunlight and storing the energy in, uh, in the form of sugars. Now, uh, in biochemistry textbooks, you see these complicated schemes. This is actually the cartoon of one of a piece of a membrane of this pancake. So if you take a piece of this and you look at it from the side, what you will see was, is sort of like this. Uh, uh, the representation is like this. And if you look deeper, you have a number of chemical reactions, all of which start by light impinging on a pair of pigments and the electron being transported across the membrane against the electric field of the membrane. So that is the condition of how you make the, the energy. You have to transport the charge against the action of the electric fields. Of, of course, you need to use some energy stored somewhere. In this case, it's the energy of a photon. And so you have photosystem one, uh, which is splitting water and producing oxygen. This is why uh, the atmosphere of the Earth contains so much, so much oxygen. It wasn't always like this. Uh, and uh, 
the, uh, this photo system, this, uh, and this is a photo system one, they work in tandem, exchanging the, the protons between them, and eventually they all, what they produce from these electrons moving across the membrane is the, uh, is the potential difference, uh, proton gradient if you want, which is later used to pump the protons across the membrane and make uh, ATP out of ADP. And that's the energy money of, uh, of all living organisms. So if you are rich in ATP, you have a lot of money, you can do a lot of things. Now PS1, if you look at the X-ray structure of the protein, is, is a big thing like this. I'm sorry, PS2 is a big thing like this. It is really, really a, a challenge to understand how it works. But you can do that uh, uh, by using the methods we will talk about today. Now, this is, uh, an, a, a, again, a little movie of uh, how photosynthesis works. Now, this time, this is not plants, this is bacteria, because bacteria also have photosynthetic apparatus. And this is purple bacteria that has a photosynthetic apparatus which is nicely symmetric. So it, it consists mainly of ring-like structures of proteins uh, that are all embedded. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to click something. It's not clicking. It's just, yeah. Now, so uh, these things are called, this is light harvesting complex, the uh, light absorbers. They are embedded in lipid membrane, which we now see from the side. So here is the membrane, and there, there are proteins sitting there. You see alpha helices. Uh, and so these guys are just for light collection. This bigger ring in the middle is the reaction center, surrounded, again, by light collection antenna. Uh, and if you put some light on it, one of the bacterial chlorophylls here gets excited. Now then it starts traveling around. It goes from the blue chlorophylls to the red ones with one picosecond lifetime. Then it jumps around here with about 100 femtosecond lifetime. And femtosecond is 10 to the minus uh, 15th of a second. And in a random fashion, it sort of uh, travels around these rings. And it only takes about 30 picoseconds to reach the LH1 and finally hop onto this pair of pigments here in the protein called reaction center. Now, when these pigments get excited, uh, or they receive the energy of light, uh, what, uh, what you see is, that, uh, is then that the, a charge transfer state, so the change, uh, a state where the electron is separated from the rest of the molecule is, uh, is created. And the electron uh, is transferred in a sequential fashion along uh, this chain of pigments here. This is the act accessory bacterial chlorophyll. So the electron first goes here in three picoseconds. Now, uh, after that, in one picosecond, it ends up on uh, bacterial pheophyton. It's a bit different pigment. And uh, within some uh, many picoseconds and even microseconds, uh, depending on which kinons are in, it ends up here on a kinon. And after this has happened, and it only took about 100 picoseconds, so much less than the excited state lives in a, in, a, in a chlorophyll, you already have a potential difference. You have charged the bio battery, and, you can, uh, uh, and, uh, and the biochemistry of the cell is later explo uh, exploiting the system. Now, this might be, uh, seem like a lot of detail, but uh, we do have an energy issue here in, on Earth, uh, along with the carbon dioxide issue. And if you look at the amount of, uh, uh, of energy that is produced, uh, captured, and used by the plants on Earth, that is actually about uh, seven, uh, this is uh, 150,000 terawatt hours. This is in BTUs. You probably know what the BTU, you don't know. Yeah, so n nobody knows what a BTU is, but for some reason Wikipedia decides to put the, uh, the graphs in BTUs. Anyway, this is 150,000 terawatt hours. And that is the consumption of energy by humanity today, per year. Now, in uh, natural plants, algae and bacteria, you capture seven times that energy naturally, producing oxygen and reducing carbon dioxide. So that uh, sort of gives you an idea that that's probably a way to do it uh, if you want to both have energy and to have less carbon dioxide. So this is important. Uh, time results. So. Time-resolved spectroscopy, to return back to our topic, is, uh, is uh, science that basically lets us to understand how these electrons... I, sh I show you a movie. Of course, that's enough to make everyone believe anything nowadays. But how do we know? And we know from time-resolved spectroscopy, we will see examples coming. Uh, other applications, uh, we all like our nice mobile phones. If they're from Samsung, they will probably have uh, AMOLED screens. 
made of organic light emitting diet, the funny heterostructures where you have uh, electricity converted into light. So it's the other way around from photosynthesis. You have energy, you convert it into light, and each pixel contains uh, three light emitting diodes with uh, heterostructures where one uh, subpixel I mean, uh, emits red light, the, the other one blue, and the other one green. And uh, it also works the other way around, so you can make these funny structures uh, containing fullerenes and pigments which capture light and produce potential difference. So this is our, let's say, best effort to mimic photosynthesis to create energy out of uh, the sun. Now, uh, closer to ourselves, our eyes are also uh, molecular machines that are converting uh, light into energy. And in the retina of our eye sits uh, these cells called rods and cones that contain uh, a rhodopsin-like protein. Uh, uh, it is actually a rhodopsin. There's also bacterial rhodopsin. They are very similar. So a protein that sits in the membrane of a cell. And uh, it has a pigment which absorbs uh, mostly well, depending on which cones are in, uh, mostly green, mostly red, or mostly blue light. And uh, basically, the cell triggers the nerve signals in your brain. So every time you are seeing something, a number of these proteins are doing their work. The pigment there is isomerizing, falling out of the protein. The protein binds the signaling partner and, uh, and eventually produces an electrical signal that travels to the brain saying, hey, I'm seeing the light. So, and nowadays people have even uh, figured out a way of cloning these proteins into the neurons. So, you take uh, a brain of a mouse, for example, you genetically alter it to have these proteins in a neuron membrane, and then you can trigger in the neurons by light. It's called optogenetics. Uh, so, basically, you can make a mouse think what you want by putting proper laser pulses onto the brain. Well, this is a bit far-fetched, but, uh, but the idea is, is like that. And again, to understand what's going on with this molecule, that's the molecule that's sitting there in this rhodopsin protein. It's, it sits there like this. It absorbs light. Within a, hundred, uh, within a picosecond, it becomes like this. So it isomerizes around this double bond over here. And it undergoes a, a full photo cycle with a lot of details. And again, we would not know about this. We would not be able to understand this without time-resolved spectroscopy. Now, this picture of a surprised monkey is uh, actually a laser damage uh, on um, uh, it's an optical damage on a laser mirror uh, taken in polarization image. So, and again, for, for engineers, for laser physicists, it's important to understand the mechanisms that lead to the laser dam. We all want bigger and better lasers and smaller ones with larger energy densities uh, in, in the cavities. And the limiting factor is almost always not the amount of power you can put in, but the, but the actual uh, robustness or uh, the ability of the optical components to withstand this, these huge powers. And again, to understand the damage mechanisms, we need the spectroscopy. Uh, well, okay, this, uh, this is a funny technique uh, where you can, um, you take a, a bit of uh, material similar to the filling in your teeth on which you put the light to make it hard. So to fill it with gel, you put some ultraviolet light and it becomes hard. The 3D printing works like this, uh, well, so at least some forms of it. And now if you two photon focus it, uh, if you focus a very intense laser pulse, uh, into, the, into this material, uh, the conditions for two photon absorption, so for the material to absorb two photons at once, uh, are formed. And then the, this material absorbs two infrared, so low energy photons, instead of one ultraviolet photon. And uh, basically, it only gets hard inside this droplet of liquid. And by moving the material or the laser beam, you can actually draw nice three-dimensional structures like this. This is an is initial paper from uh, Kavata from 1996. And you can do microstructures in the volume so you can produce uh, whatever uh, things you want. And again, to understand the mechanisms here, like, uh, like two photons excite your molecule, produce a radical, the radical uh, finds another monomer, it uh, joins with it and produces a radical on the other end, and so the polymer chain starts growing, and at some point it stops. How it works, nobody actually knows. People just know the materials that work, and they are producing uh, these microstructures. 
Now, again, this is something to be addressed by spectroscopy. So I hope I have convinced you that uh, spectroscopy is uh, basically original spectroscopy, like hydrogen atom spectroscopy, opened uh, the way to understand quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics was basically science written down to figure out why hydrogen emits one, uh, some frequencies and does not emit other ones. And now if you do it time resolved, if you follow it with time, that uh, becomes a tool to understand what's happening with the matter, uh, how it is functioning in time. So that is uh, basically, since steady state spectroscopy is directly related to quantum structure of material, uh, the time resolved spectroscopy opens the way to understand the quantum functioning of material. So that's, uh, that is uh, basically the idea uh, why it is interesting and important science for us to study. Now, uh, it has been a tremendous progress over the years. This is actually an old paper from our university back from 1981, when I was five years old. Uh, no, maybe, yeah, five years old. And the people were already doing time-resolved spectroscopy with picosecond lasers uh, of, of the day. Uh, it is funny to read nowadays that the measuring data were processed by a mini-computer, which in addition controlled the parameters of the experiment. And that is presented like a scientific achievement in those days. So that is uh, nowadays when you have Arduinos and the, all the gadgetry and wizardry of electronics, it actually seems a bit dated. But of course, the time is, time is not standing still. And uh, in 1996, this is a setup people were drawing in 1996, about the time when I was a student. And uh, so basically, at the time, they still drew the lasers, which they used. They, they built the lasers themselves to actually do the research on the molecules. They did a lot of nice work, but then the spectroscopy field was still first make your tool and then uh, do the research with it. And uh, so making the tool was very, very big part of the business. Nowadays, it has changed a bit. So this is actually a picture which Nicoletta probably recognizes. This is a lab in Cluj uh, where uh, they basically got a, a large grant of money and they bought the lasers the spectrometers to do time-resolved fluorescence, time-resolved absorption, and whatnot. And uh, basically, uh, the whole works uh, from a single grant, and uh, it was installed over a week. Uh, it seems to be working, uh, so I'm getting questions from them uh, sometimes in, uh, about how to work this. This is a company, Light Conversion, who is making all these things that is from my native town, from basically a spin-off from our department. And they give you the full works, including the data analysis software about which we will talk a bit. Okay, so this is the way of the history and the motivation for this. And now the number of processes that can be addressed uh, mostly involve these tiny things, the molecules and the charge carriers and semiconductors dancing around in the matter. So you can look at the charge transfer, the proton or electron moving from one part of the molecule onto the other. You can look at the solvent or environment response when you excite, let's say, a molecule that is sitting in a solvent. Solvent molecules will feel it. They do something uh, to rearrange according to the changed configuration of the solute. And that you can follow with spectroscopy. You can look at vibrational relaxation. So if you dump a lot of energy on the molecule, it somehow distributes it around its uh, vibrations of nuclei. It start vibrating in different uh, manner. Uh, you can look at energy transfer, so the process integral in photosynthesis. You can look at the photoreaction dynamics, so like the, uh, the event that is happening in your eye. Every time you see a photon, basically you have a photoreaction going on. You can also follow, it is a big field of uh, following carrier dynamics, both in, in bulk semiconductors, so like what happens to the electron when you put it in the conduction band by using a photon. Essentially, there is a number of ways of things that can happen. We will talk about it a little bit uh, <laughs> over the coming three hours. And uh, 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 also, in the, uh, in the quantum structures, uh, there's a, an additional twist to it. When you limit the space for the electron, the quantum effects, uh, so the discrete states, become more and more pronounced. And that, again, you can follow using your spectroscopy. So, Basically, what you're doing, you're exploring how the spectra, absorption, fluorescence, uh, some funny spectra like uh, four-wave mixing spectra and things like that are changing in time in molecules, solid state, and maybe nanostructures. 
Now, molecule. Molecule is a, a thing that is commonly represented in uh, physical chemistry textbooks using the Oblonsky diagram, where you have you know, a ground state full of vibrational sublevels, excited states, you have triplet states. And when you excite the molecule, it sort of will do internal conversion here, maybe do a fluorescence, or maybe it will uh, intersystem cross into the uh, triplet manifold, and then you will have phosphorescence. And so, uh, basically, this is a framework for understanding how a molecule works. It's not a, a fully explanatory scheme, but it's good enough to start with. Now you're excited, uh, you can have a number of processes going on, which, which were shown. You can have radiative relaxation, i.e. fluorescence or phosphorescence, internal conversion, so radiation less relaxation. You can have intersystem crossing, form formation of the triplet states, solvation, photoinduced reactions, and so on. Now if we look at it with fluorescence, we only see the light output while the molecule is still excited. While it's still high, it can still emit a photon, so we can follow what's happening with her. And these processes, of course, result in the change of the fluorescence spectrum. All of them invariably change the fluorescence spectrum and intensity of the molecule. And therefore, by following it, you can actually deduce what the molecule is doing. But it's only useful while the excited state is pres preserved. If you make a photo product, which is different from the original ground state, but it's not emitting light, then it's, this information is lost for you. Again, you can do the same with the, with the bulk semiconductors. So you can excite the electron from the uh, valence band to the conduction band and follow it around as it relaxes in different valleys and equilibrates and so on. You can do it in organic semiconductor as well. That's a bit, uh, normally it's drawn using a bit different structures. But again, in order to make a photovoltaic cell, organic photovoltaic cell, you need to know the fate of the excited state. When you, when you excite the molecule, or maybe a, a, a disordered semiconductor as the, as the polymers normally are, uh, you need to know what the, where the electron is going, how it is ending up on the acceptor, and what is uh, preventing the electron from reaching the contact to generate the, uh, the photovoltage. And again, uh, in solid state, you can have band-to-band -band radiative recombination with light output, shockley reed hall uh, uh, trap-assisted recombination, so that when the electron goes first to the trap and then back to the, uh, to the val uh, valence band, uh, uh, that can be either uh, radiative or non-radiative. You can have non-radiative recombination, electrons being trapped, a number of processes. As long as you have light output, so as long as there's still some light coming out of this uh, material, you can, you can follow what's going on using time-resolved spectroscopy. And when uh, you make the semiconductor small enough for the quantum uh, effects to kick in uh, full uh, time, so basically you... Uh, the continuum of states becomes a set of discrete states, as, in, as it does in a quantum dot or a quantum well. Then uh, you have a hybrid picture between a molecule and a, and a bulk semiconductor, so you don't, they, they are not really discrete states sometimes, but, uh, uh, but uh, you have pronounced bands similar to the molecule. So a quantum dot is a hybrid structure, which is also very interesting to study by time results of trust. Now, okay, so essentially the signal, in a very simple terms, uh, what you are measuring when looking at time result fluorescence will look like this. You will excite your molecules with a short laser pulse, which is drawn in gray here, uh, and the fluorescence of the, of the number of molecules will grow as the integral of this, uh, of this laser pulse. So basically, the, each bit of arriving of the laser pulse will put more molecules in the excited state, and they will start fluorescing. Now, if there was no decay, if they've stayed in the excited state, they will simply stay there. But, uh, of course, uh, the molecules will not stay excited forever. Uh, the equilibrium needs to be established, so they, they will go back to the ground state one way or the other uh, with the lifetime tau. And uh, basically, the, the form of a signal that you are looking at is this integral of the pulse, which is an error function plus one, more or less, uh, times the decaying exponent. Uh, now, I have to stress that this is a very simple picture, and this is uh, not very interesting in itself, because if, the molecule, if all it does, the molecule gets excited and it goes back to the ground state, the only thing you can measure is the relaxation time. Eh? So the whole spectrum will si simply uniformly decay, uh, uh, and spectral dimension, spectral degree of freedom will not give you any information. 
Now, of course, life is never so simple, especially with molecules, not even with atoms, but especially with molecules, uh, life is never so simple, and you will have different decay times uh, at different wavelengths describing you what's happening with the spectrum in time. All right, so let's look at the techniques uh, that allow you to address this. And the first fluorescence technique uh, that uh, allows you to look at it is time-correlated single photon counting. Uh, since this is an imaging workshop, I think somebody should have uh, mentioned it. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if they did, but uh, I will briefly introduce it. Now, if you look at, uh, at the fluorescence of a sample uh, us uh, using a, a fast photomultiplier and uh, a fast oscilloscope with persistence on, you will see that fluorescence is coming as an unsteady train of pulses of different amplitudes, and, um, but uh, and arriving at, at uh, random times. So that is the, uh, the, uh, uh, basically the idea that when you excite the sample, the sample after some time, it will emit the photon, and that after some time is actually what you want to look at, but uh, the process is completely random. So the molecule has a probability of decaying, and it will decay uh, at some point, but when it, it will happen, uh, you don't know. You can only do the st statistics of it. So, so the single photon timing is actually a statistical method that is measuring the time interval between the arrival of a photon from a sample and the laser pulse that, that excited it. So if you look now at the laser excitation pulse train, so this is 80 megahertz, megahertz laser, let's say it's a titanium sapphire laser, emitting pulses every 12 nanoseconds. Now the fluorescence after each pulse from the sample, from the bulk, will decay exponentially when you excite. So you will see a train of fluorescence pulses. Now, if this train is, if, if the fluorescence is very weak, so you can attenuate the excitation light as, uh, uh, as much as possible. Now, if you, if you do it, if look at, uh, and if you look at single events of photon emission, you will have these events occurring each after a certain time period uh, after a corresponding excitation pulse. And now if you do it many, many times, so 80 megahertz is 80 million pulses per second, so if you do it at least for half a second, you have a good chance of collecting uh, a large number of photons. And if you can measure the time at which each photon has arrived, you can reconstruct the probability distribution, which is nothing else than the decay of your fluorescence. So the good thing about, about uh, this type of measurement is that you are actually looking at the timing. You are not... Uh, concerned, this, this doesn't look like a nice signal. Eh? So, uh, the amplitudes of each photon produced uh, by each photon in your detector are different. But it doesn't matter as long as you only use the time information of the photon arrival and not the amplitude information. Now, so the way it is organized is like this. You take a, a laser producing short pulses, and it can be a diode laser. It doesn't have to be a femtosecond uh, titanium sapphire laser. Diode lasers are perfectly capable of making uh, you know, 30, 50 picosecond pulses, which is more than enough for this experiment. Uh, part of it you use to trigger a fast photodiode. And the signal of the fast photodiode will start a device called time to amplitude converter. You can think of it as a capacitor being charged up using a constant current. So it's a ramp generator, which is started by the trigger pulse here. So your voltage is increasing linearly until the photon from fluorescence is detected by the photomultiplier, and the signal comes here and stops the measurement. So basically, what you have at the end of the sequence is the voltage proportional to the, arrive, uh, to the time difference between the excitation and the, and the fluorescence, uh, fluorescence emission by the sample. And uh, if you analyze these times, so you do it many, many times, you convert these times to numbers, and you store them in the shape of a histogram, that is basically your fluorescence decay curve. And uh, just to say a word, you are not limited uh, if, with a clever electronic tricks called constant fraction discrimination, where you uh, take this pulse, delay it by a bit, and subtract the two. You can do it with fast electronics. And you look for the zero crossing point here. That does not depend on the amplitude. If you trigger with an oscilloscope on the pulse it, pulses with different amplitudes, your triggering time will depend on how big the pulse is. Whereas if you 
do it uh, by shifting one pulse with respect to the other and subtracting them, the zero crossing point will always be constant. And this timing is in fact pretty accurate, so you can uh, easily have uh, time resolution of uh, with current uh, day detectors of 100 picoseconds, maybe 200 picoseconds, depends on the detector. But uh, it's a very nice technique, and uh, it uh, gives you a time resolution of 50 to 150 picosecond. It's relatively cheap. With the electronics for it will cost about, uh, I think, 10,000 euros is a good estimate uh, for, for the whole uh, works. It can produce extremely good signal to noise as long as you count long enough these photons. It, uh, it uh, basically you simply accumulating your curve, and uh, the good thing about it uh, is that it in, it's totally independent on the stability of the laser. So your laser, you can switch it off for half an hour, or you know take it away for repairs. Then you bring it back, put your light back onto the sample, and the thing keeps counting, and your and your curve is still what it was before. So that is actually very nice. Uh, it's inherently single color because there's one detector, one start and one stop signal, but that makes it uh, suitable for the imaging in uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging type of microscopy. So basically you can measure uh, the fluorescence with time resolution under a microscope. Now uh, for uh, a little bit more advanced technique, you have a, a device called a street camera, which is an optoelectronic device. So basically what it does, it converts light into electrons. It uses a very fast rising electric field to uh, sweep these electrons in space. So basically like an old fashioned oscilloscope or old fashioned TV, well old fashioned TV used the, the coils, but this used the uh, deflection plates. So the electrons that are knocked out of the photocathode, uh, they are accelerated and then they pass the def deflection space between the two capacitor plates with a fast uh, rising voltage there. And basically the arrival time of electron will then, since the late electron will see higher voltage than the early electron, uh, the arrival time of the electron will be converted into the, uh, into the position in space. So what you can do with this, this three camera, you basically change, uh, encode temporal information, the time of arrival of a photon, into the spatial information, so the position of a photon uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, the uh, microchannel plate. So that's a type of photo, photo multiplier which amplifies the electrons. Uh, and uh, basically it's consisting of a number of little channels where you have uh, photo, photo multiplier action. The electron knocks out another one, then another one, a number of them. And basically you have a, a large torrent of electrons at the end of it. And uh, so uh, these electrons later will hit the phosphor screen, li again, like in an old-fashioned TV. And this image of electrons will be converted to light again and be detected by a CCD camera. So that's uh, basically the way it looks. It's a box like this. Uh, the only supplier in the world of these things is Hamamatsu in Japan. Uh, and uh, these things uh, are unfortunately uh, quite expensive. But the, nice, the very nice thing about them is they're very sensitive and very uh, uh, nice in the sense that you can use one dimension in space to measure your time information and the other you can uh, spread the spectrum in. So if you take a grating or a prism, you make a spectrum at the entrance of the street camera. So you come in with a spectrum. You have a spectrum spread in time. So simultaneously record the entire spectrum with a time resolution of one to two picoseconds. And uh, it's a lot more sensitive than uh, uh, other methods with femtosecond time resolution that I will briefly talk about. Uh, and uh, so if you can afford it, this is what you, can, wh what you should have. Uh, now, this problem with street camera is still that it, the time resolution is above one picosecond. The realistic one is probably two to three picoseconds from what my experience. And so you need to use clever methods to get down to the femtoseconds. Uh, the very, very fast uh, events you cannot measure with street camera. And so you, you turn to nonlinear optic tricks. This is a, the bread and butter of laser physics. When you shine two intense light fields onto a crystal, you can have conditions 
uh, where the two photons are glued into one. That's called some frequency generation. So omega-1 and omega-2 come into the crystal, and they uh, b become omega-1 plus omega-2. So it's a, a second harmonic generation is a, is a separate case of that when, uh, when the frequencies are equal. But the nice thing about it is that the intensity of this outgoing field, of the up-converted field, up-conversion means the frequency goes up, uh, is proportional both to, uh, to, uh, to both intensities. So if you mix your fluorescence with a laser pulse that can be arbitrarily short, uh, the signal that you are measuring uh, will be proportional to the intensity of your uh, laser pulse and your fluorescence. So if your laser pulse is cons constant, you, what, you, what you, you will have at the end is the Propor signal proportional to the intensity of fluorescence. Of course, the wavelength of the sum frequency will be shifted upwards, uh, well, downwards, will be shorter than the, the one of the fluorescence. And now, so if you can afford uh, uh, having a very short gating pulse, you can make it arrive earlier or later with femtosecond resolution. So femtosecond resolution is obtained by letting the lights travel more or less in space. So in one nanosecond, the light, the light will travel 30 centimeters. Now, if you want femtoseconds, it will be some microns, but that you can arrange with uh, precision mechanical stages. And uh, by varying the arrival time of the gate pulse, you are measuring the signal that is proportional to the intensity of the fluorescence at the arrival time of the gate. And if the intensity of the gate is always the same, then essentially your signal will simply be proportional to the intensity of fluorescence at, at that uh, instance in time. So the way you do it in the realistic setup, you take your femtosecond laser light from a titanium sapphire laser, you split the beam into two, Part of the beam is your gate pulse. That is the, the delay, so which you can vary. So by, by varying this delay, you change the arrival time of your gate pulse. And uh, you put uh, this gate onto a crystal together with a fluorescence, which you excite here. So if you uh, focus your beam into the crystal to make uh, ultraviolet light, and then focus it onto the sample, the sample will emit fluorescence, which you, from which you will filter out your excitation light, and eventually you get, what you get is, uh, uh, is a fluorescence light falling onto the crystal together with the gate light. And that uh, light becomes up-converted inside the crystal. What you uh, then do is you send it through the spectrograph and record it with a conventional sensitive CCD camera. Now, the Problem with this technique, the nice bit about this technique is the fact that you have femtosecond time resolution. It's only limited by the gate pulse uh, and the dispersion of the optical components, but it's easy to have it down to 150, 200 femtoseconds uh, with a titanium sapphire laser. Now, uh, one problem is that, of course, this nonlinear process which you use to map out your fluorescence is sensitive to the uh, to the uh, nonlinearity of the crystal. So the crystal parameter is different at each wavelength. Uh, the uh, detectivity of your spectrograph is different at each wavelength. And uh, so basically the relative intensities of these traces need to be calibrated to match your steady state fluorescence spectrum. Otherwise, uh, you can only look at the time behavior, but the, the absolute intensity has no meaning here. Uh, now, of course, you need a lot of excitation light, and that's, uh, that can be bad for biological samples. And uh, experiments, of course, take time because your, the phase matching condition, so basically the momentum conservation uh, law for the, these two beams, you need to rotate the crystal to actually uh, be able to upconvert different frequencies of fluorescence. So since you are rotating the crystal and recording the spectrum, that takes a bit of time to record. And your wavelength resolution will be limited by the, by the spectral width of the gate pulse. Now, another nonlinear optical trick uh, that does allow you to get uh, femtosecond time resolution and fluorescence is optical curve shutter. Optical curve effect is the effect where you put a very, uh, a very intense light on the sample, and basically the refractive index of the light becomes uh, uh, dependent on the intensity of a field that you are putting on it. So to the first approximation, it's just the refractive index of the material. 
uh, and to the second order, it is proportional to the intensity. So what will happen to the beam uh, in, inside such material? It will start to make a beam profile like uh, a gradient in the refractive index, and the beam will start to self-focus. But we are not talking about, about that right now. What, what I want to talk is, is the optical Kerr effect, where you basically uh, produce the refractive index using a linearly polarized light. And if you do that, your sample in the electric field, uh, a glass, a piece of quartz, a piece of sapphire, water, whatever, every material, will become birefringent because this N2 part will depend on the polarization of the field, which, is, which has intensity I. Now, if you have birefringence, you can have rotation of polarization. And if you now arrange your polarizer and analyzer in such a way that fluorescence cannot pass it, and then you do the, your birefringence using the optical Kerr effect, again with a short gate pulse, for a very, very tiny moment of time, so for the duration of the gate pulse, this uh, material will become uh, birefringent and rotate the polarization of your fluorescence. So basically, some of the fluorescence will pass the second uh, polarizer, and you, you will be able to detect it. And again, by varying the delay of the gate pulse, you can map out what's happening with the fluorescence in time. Now, the nice bit about it is uh, that you don't uh, change the wavelengths, so you don't mix the wavelengths, and uh, you don't lose the spectral resolution the way you did in the upconversion experiment. The Problem with it, or there are many problems with it, uh, as uh, there always are with uh, nonlinear optics, uh, is uh, that you need extremely high laser intensities, and uh, the, your, your curve medium, so the, your, the, your shutter, starts, is prone to start generating uh, all kinds of unpleasant light by itself when you put so much light on it. And uh, the, some of the materials like water or CS2 that are traditionally used for this, they have a non-momentary non, non response. So basically, they remember a bit that the, there was a pulse which oriented the molecules there. So water and CS2 uh, are only good up to a picosecond time resolution. So experiments are troublesome. And, uh, uh, but this is one of the ways to get down to femtosecond time domain. Uh, now, a funny technique that I should say a few words about is, is called uh, frequency domain uh, fluorescence lifetime measurements uh, or phase fluorimetry. And that's based on the fact that if there's a delay between the time when you excite the sample and the time that the fluorescence is emitted, and the delay is fluorescence lifetime, obviously, uh, the will, if you modulate your excitation light, there will be a phase shift between, uh, between the emission and excitation. And if you mix the two, in a, in a, uh, you, mod you modulate your excitation light with very high frequency, so in the megahertz and gigahertz even regime, and you detect it with a radio type of detector, you can detect the phase difference between the, between the two lights, the light beams, and that would, uh, that would be a, uh, uh, basically a uh, fluorescence lifetime. The phase shifts will correspond to the fluorescence lifetime. So there are tricks. If you change the modulation frequency, of course, at high frequencies, your slow sample, slow emitting sample, will not be able to follow the modulation. And so the amplitude of the modulation will fall re with respect to the, s the lower frequencies. And from that, you can actually even get more than one lifetime. And again, uh, uh, this is uh, the way you do it. You basically treat your molecule as an electronic filter, the response, uh, an integrating filter, the response of which you are measuring. And you can even do it for several lifetimes, so multi-exponential decays can be addressed from that. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it's not without its problems. It seems good on paper, but uh, of course the, the problem with it is that it relies on the Fourier transform or for the filter response to be mapped onto lifetimes. And this can be tricky. Uh, you get non-intuitive artifacts and uh, your data recovery is essentially based on the model for fluorescence decay, uh, which uh, assumes exponential decays, and maybe they are not exponential, so since you are not measuring it directly, you don't know. But it's a very good choice if you have a number, a large number of samples, a batch of a cell cultures or something like that, that you want to measure, and uh, so you, it's, it's normally implement, implemented in a simple fluorometer, so you just swap one after the other and you get fluorescence lifetime measurements of multiple samples.
Now, so this is for the techniques. Now let's look at the applications. And uh, my first application of single phototyping is uh, called Flim for Fret. And if you want to look cool, you should always use a lot of abbreviation. And uh, okay, Flim is fluorescence lifetime imaging, and uh, Fret is uh, first uh, resonance energy transfer. Now, fluorescence lifetime imaging is a, uh, is a simple alteration to a confocal scanning microscope, with which I'm sure you're all familiar. Uh, basically, what you do is you simply change the detector by a photon counter here and connect, uh, connect it to the photon, uh, single photon timing electronics. That's all you do. So it's a, a couple of boards in your PC and, uh, and a photo multiplier that can count single photons. And you can turn your microscope uh, from the intensity measurement uh, in, at each single point that you are scanning. You can now measure the fluorescence decay. So essentially one number, fluorescence intensity, is converted into a curve that is representing the fluorescence decay at each pixel uh, of your image. Uh, first, our energy transfer is, a, is basically a, a mechanism of uh, transferring the excitation between two molecules. So if you have donor molecule excited it, it, and it's interacting weakly with the acceptor, uh, it can go down from its excited to the ground state and it can produce the excited state of the acceptor. So in the end, you have transferred the energy from one molecule to the other. And it, it's important in photosynthesis and as well as in other fields. And uh, basically, the transfer rate between donor and acceptor will be proportional to the overlap integral between donor fluorescence and acceptor absorbance. And um, uh, basically, uh, w uh, the experiment that you do, you excite your donor and you look for the fluorescence uh, of the acceptor. Now, this is an R, uh, one over uh, distance to the sixth power. So this is a very sensitive ruler, this thing. Uh, uh, I sh uh, well, I should probably say about something about the assumptions of the model, but uh, uh, that can be done later. It's, it's a very uh, sensitive ruler where you label the two pieces of cell or a single protein even, and you want to follow how it's folding. Basically, when the donor gets close to the acceptor, uh, you get uh, the fluorescence transfer rate increasing as the r to the power 6, as a distance to the 6th power. And so it's very sensitive to the distances, and it's basically an optical ruler for the distances of about 10 nanometers. Uh, and uh, you can follow protein folding and interaction of sun substrates and enzymes inside the cells and things like that, and it's a, it's a widely used tool in biology. Now, the assumptions for the first model are actually quite stringent. It's very strange uh, that, uh, that uh, the model works to some extent. Uh, so the assumptions are that uh, when the transfer is over, the acceptor will forget everything about where it got the energy from. Uh, there is no orbital overlap, so the molecules cannot be touching each other, more or less. The coupling is dipole-dipole type. That's okay. That's probably uh, always the case, or almost always the case with the molecules. And the donor has to be in the, uh, so the bottom of its excited state before emitting. Uh, now, it's a miracle that the model works, but it does, and it even does for photosynthesis, which is uh, interesting. And you can do it uh, under a simple fluorescence microscope, simply looking for your acceptor fluorescence intensity by exciting the donor. And that will tell you something about whether the energy transfer is happening or not, and hence whether the donor and acceptor are close one to the other or not. Uh, but a, a, a much better way is to look at the donor lifetime. So if the, if the donor has acceptor siphoning away the energy from him, the fluorescence lifetime will decrease. So it will lose the excitations more quickly. And uh, if you look at the intensity, you don't know the concentrations. You may have overlapping absorption spectra between the donor and acceptor. So you don't know whether you're exciting acceptor directly or you're exciting the donor and uh, the calibration and control is tricky, whereas if you look at the lifetimes, it's very simple. What you get compared to the uh, donor without transfer would be the decay like this, and when the transfer kicks in, your donor fluorescence develops a fast component which corresponds to energy transfer time to the donor. And so the example here, for example, uh, again from an old paper in 1999, you have three cells, you micro-inject one with the activator, uh, and uh, you basically look at the fluorescence images and you see no change. So basically the middle uh, cell between uh, 
the, these two is not really signaling. The difference between the three cells is not obvious uh, how, uh, whether the, the, the activation process has taken place or not. Whereas if you look at the lifetime image, so you just plot the uh, uh, lifetime and false color here. After the injection, you see this middle cell lighting up like a Christmas tree, which basically tells you that, okay, this one is, has been activated. These ones are still the same as they used to be. Okay, uh, another application of fluorescence that I uh, would like to discuss is the isomerization of retinal bacteria or dopsin, and that's, uh, you know, a, a, a protein that I told you about. Uh, it's, uh, a, in fact, bacteria or dopsin is a, is a workhorse for molecular biology and is a polygon of application of new spectroscopies. Uh, and back in 2012, I did uh, literature research and so you have, on bacteria rhodopsin, you have 34 papers in nature, 43 in science, and 173 in PNAS, which is uh, basically to say that uh, it's, it's a very attractive system to study. Yeah? It's not, if not uh, for, for understanding the system itself, then uh, for applying new methods that you want to investigate on a well-known system. And it's a protein that is uh, part of uh, purple membranes in bacteria, and the, uh, the function of it is a, is a proton pump. So it absorbs the photon and it uses the energy to pump the proton across the membrane. The protein itself looks like this, uh, and it's very similar to rhodopsin, part of your eye. This is the pigment that sits, sits in it, it's called retinol. And uh, basically when you put some light on the pigment, it absorbs in the green, in the yellow, 580 nanometers. When you put some light on it, it isomerizes and uh, further the proton transfer takes place. But the isomerization step was a challenge to laser spectroscopies for a very long time. You read the papers from the 60s throughout the 70s, 80s and the early 90s and it's always the conclusion is that the isomerization is of the order of the instrument response function of your laser setter. So basically the, the very short pulse was still not available at the time and the nature was faster. And the first time uh, when this was addressed uh, was uh, in uh, 1993 uh, when Graham Fle Fleming and May Du did fluorescence of conversion experiments on, on uh, bacteria or rhodopsin. And what they saw actually is that after the absorption of light, the fluorescence develops very quickly, but with, within one picosecond, so 10 to the minus 12 of a second, uh, the, most of the fluorescence is already lost. And so basically the isomerization takes place very fast on the excited state uh, potential surface. And uh, basically the, after one picosecond, bacterial rhodopsin has already come to this point where it takes uh, the decision whether it wants to go to the uh, isomerized state or go back to the ground state. And so, but this was the first time when, when uh, it was demonstrated that nature does actually use the photon energy within a picosecond. Uh, and uh, this is very fast and without fluorescence of conversion we would know, not know about it. And now another favorite tool of molecular biologists is green fluorescent protein that was awarded a Nobel Prize of, uh, back in 2008. Uh, this is a protein that comes from a jellyfish and it's interesting because it, uh, when it is synthesized, it falls into this uh, beta sheet structure and out of three amino acids inside it uh, will form a chromophore, uh, something that absorbs uh, in the uh, visible and emits, more importantly, it emits light in the green. Hence, it's a green fluorescent protein. It's not a dye, it's not toxic, it's a protein, so you can genetic genetically code it for any organism you, you like. And, well, there were these experiments where they made transgenic mice with green fluorescent skills. So they basically fused the green fluorescent protein uh, into the epithelium of the skin of the mouse. And if you put the mouse under UV light, it starts uh, emitting green light, like it's radioactive or something. Uh, so uh, poor mice, but, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, this is not a very... Uh, meaningful experiment, but this molecule is actually has, is a tremendous value to molecular biology as a label to actually label different proteins and follow their interactions in the cells using fluorescence. Now, uh, the chromophore that is formed out of the amino acids looks like this. This is a view from the top. Uh, it's protected by this beta sheet structure. 
And uh, if you look at the absorption spectrum, it absorbs uh, at basically the UV. So the main absorption band is at 400 nanometers, and it emits light in the green. And the reason for this huge Stokes shift, why the fluorescence is so far away from the absorption wavelength, uh, was not really known before the experiments, uh, the time resolved experiments were done. And so basically, the usual suspect is this hydrogen sitting over here. So back in 1996, uh, uh, Steve Boxer and company did the experiments where they measured the fluorescence at two wavelengths, one in the and in the green, again with a, with a picosecond time resolution, that is with fluorescence upconversion. And what they saw is that the blue fluorescence appears instantaneously when you excite the green fluorescence prote uh, fluorescent protein. But then it decays with about uh, 20 picosecond lifetime. And with the same lifetime, you see the green fluorescent rise, fluorescence rise. So it sort of tells you that there is something going on with a time scale of 20 picosecond that makes your fluorescence go from blue to green. And that something could be addressed by replacing this hydrogen that's sitting there in the, in the pigment. So this guy here, which in the protein structure will be here. Uh, if you replace it by the deuterium, you get these, the same dynamics, only a lot slower. So you make the, your hydrogen two times, uh, two times heavier. And instead of 20 picoseconds, you now get uh, maybe 100 picoseconds. And uh, in, uh, the rise of the green fluorescence mimics that. So their conclusion was, was that uh, it's, actually, oh, sorry, it's actually the, uh, the uh, uh, proton transfer that results for the huge Stokes shifts for, for the green fluorescence uh, protein. So it, it depends on the weight of the proton, and you can see one state, initial state, disappear, and the green emissive state appear in, uh, in, in the system. Now, my favorite uh, molecule, light harvesting complex from photosynthesis. You saw these rings in bacteria in the movie that I, uh, I showed you uh, earlier. Uh, this uh, is a ring containing two rings of bacterial chlorophylls, a tightly packed one called B850, which is responsible for this absorption band here. And the loosely uh, packed ones, the blue ones that are here, and they are responsible for the absorption at 800 nanometer. And there are also carotenoids, uh, which absorb the green light. So these are uh, rhodopin glucoside molecules, uh, orange ones, uh, that are here. And again, uh, the energy transfer, this, the, the whole function of this protein is actually capturing the solar light, absorbing photons at whichever wavelength, and transferring them over to the reaction center. So this is the antenna that collects the light from the sun. And, uh, Again, it was not known how fast and uh, 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 precisely how the energy is traveling in the system. And uh, in uh, 1996, Ralph Jimenez and uh, again, Graham Fleming uh, did these experiments where they excited uh, this complex with 800 nanometer light. So they excited these blue uh, uh, bacteria chlorophylls and looked at the fluorescence of the complex uh, in the uh, 870 nanometer region. And what they saw was actually that the fluorescence did not appear instantaneously, but it took about 800 femtoseconds for it to grow in. And that means that what happens is uh, you have your uh, energy from the, these, this blue ring being transferred to the green ring, and that takes 800 femtoseconds. Now that's uh, all nice and well, uh, except for the fact that when, uh, and this is downhill energy transfer, so you put the energy here and it hops onto here 800 femtoseconds. That's okay. That, that you can follow by uh, exciting selectively this band and then following the fluorescence somewhere here. But how fast are the uh, excitations transferred within the green ring here? That was uh, a question that, that uh, was a bit more difficult to address, but uh, using their ingenuity, uh, they uh, also answered that question, and what they did is they measured fluorescence and isotropy. So basically, when you excite a molecule, it has a, a dipole moment, which will sort of be happy to be excited when, when your polarization of the electric field is along the direction of the dipole, uh, and uh, not so happy when it's perpendicular. Uh, and so when you have uh, your sample, you excite it with polarized light, uh, you will pre-select all the dipoles that are lying along the polarization uh, uh, of, of your laser light. 
And then when the energy gets transferred, distributed around the molecule, of course, the dipoles of these, mo of these acceptor molecule molecules are oriented differently from the dipole that you are looking at. Now then, what happens is that with time, as the energy is being uh, uh, baseballed around this, this green ring, your fluorescence will decay, uh, anisotropy will decay. So uh, from, uh, from, com uh, from remembering the direction of excitation, your fluorescence will start forgetting it. And the speed with which it forgets will correspond to the energy transfer time within this a single band of bacterial chlorophylls. And that, is, that was what uh, uh, Jimenez and Fleming did. They measured fluorescence and isotropy. And so the measurement is more or less the same. You put uh, polarized light on the sample and you use uh, polarizer through which you look at the emission. And you look at the parallel. So if you excite like this, your parallel will be like this. Perpendicular will be like this. And the parallel component uh, initially, well, it's always a bit greater than, uh, than uh, perpendicular. But if you calculate the anisotropy, which for a single molecule, which is standing still, should be 0 0.4, uh, you can actually see that there is a very, very fast decay of anisotropy here. So it starts off maybe at 0 0.4. You don't really see it. It's faster than, than your time resolution. But then it decays within uh, more or less 100 femtoseconds already to the terminal value, which represents the, the degree of uh, anisotropy corresponding to the uh, excitations equilibrated over the entire ring. So of course, if, if you excite a chlorophyll here, uh, at some point with energy transfer, it will be distributed equally, but it still will visit this chlorophyll here sometimes. So there will be some terminal an anisotropy left. And uh, basically, the answer from this experiment is that within this tightly packed ring of bacterial chlorophyll, the energy is being footballed around at the rate of 100 femtoseconds between each pair of bacterial chlorophyll. And that's very fast, and that was a fascinating uh, realization that in nature you have energy transfer on the 100 femtosecond time scale, uh, and uh, this is why perhaps uh, the collection of light in photosynthesis is so efficient. So quantum efficiency of photosynthesis is uh, close to unity, it's about 95%. Uh, that means that each photon that is absorbed is actually used for separating charges. It doesn't mean the energy uh, uh, efficiency is that high, it's probably less, it's probably 30%, but nevertheless uh, it is uh, formidable that the photons are used so well. Now, and so these, this is for the applications of uh, time-resolved fluorescence. And it's a very nice technique, and it's good. But the, the problem with fluorescence is that it only is giving you information while your sample is emitting light. And not all samples emit light. Well, most of you don't emit light uh, in your active state, so to speak. Eh? So, uh, and even if you excite the molecule with the light, uh, a lot of times, the energy of the light is used to produce some different sort of molecule that does its job in the ground state and the light emission is lost. So uh, since uh, we also want to look at these processes, we switch to uh, time-resolved absorption spectroscopy, also known as pump and probe. Well, the reason I have a car and the rainbow here is just, uh, you know, it's a spectroscopy and the observation of spectrum is after the rain when the sun comes out. Uh, so we talk about pump probe spectroscopy, and come on, yeah, okay. So uh, basically, again, to think about what we are measuring, we want to measure the change of the absorption in the sample when we have excited uh, the sample, be it uh, molecules, nanostructures, semiconductors. And so uh, let's use a concept of the molecule to illustrate what's happening. So this, the, uh, if you don't touch the molecules, they happily sit in their ground state. You excite them uh, using your laser light. Uh, what happens is that part of the molecules have left the ground state. So if the, you now compare the absorption spectrum of the molecules uh, of the sample before and after the excitation, you will see that uh, some of the absorption is lost. So it, there will be a negative contribution to a signal called ground state bleaching. So basically molecules left the ground state, they are not absorbing there any longer, therefore negative uh, uh, contribution to the uh, difference absorption. Now, as the molecules uh, that left the ground state, they have uh, appeared in the excited state, 
Uh, what they can do then, if you look at the absorption spectrum of the sample, they can either absorb the light with which you are looking, and that uh, causes the so-called excited state absorption. So that's this contribution. Absorption that was not there before you excited it, but after you excited it, it, it appeared. And now uh, another process that can happen is a stimulated emission. So basically it's like a lasing action. The molecules in the excited state, they can amplify the light with which you are looking at the absorption spectrum. So the, so at some wavelengths corresponding roughly to the fluorescence spectrum of the sample, you get more light uh, after the excitation than without the excitation. So basically you get uh, a signal, a negative absorption. So the amplification, you will have another negative uh, band appearing in your difference absorption spectrum, and that's called stimulated emission. Now if the molecule is doing something interesting, is going along happily along his, uh, the, uh, its reaction coordinate. Uh, of course, uh, these uh, energies of the excited states and the ground states will change. And if you look at the excited state spectrum and the stimulated emission spectrum, the wavelengths may be different. So these band, bands will shift around with time. And as the molecules return to the ground state, they will uh, gradually disappear. And if they return completely to the ground state, uh, they will uh, basically uh, recover the original spectrum and the different signal will go back to zero. So pump probe spectroscopy is a type of time-resolved spectroscopy that monitors uh, the, the time evolution of a difference absorption spectrum, that is absorption difference between uh, sample is excited versus sample is not excited. Okay, so to reiterate quickly, the spectrum consists of ground state bleaching. The shape is identical to the absorption spectrum, and the signal is negative. Stimulated emission, the shape of which is trivially, uh, is almost, in molecular world, it's almost always the same as the fluorescence spectrum. It is uh, an uh, omega to the power four multiplier uh, in, the in the Einstein coefficient equation, but uh, in, in, at large frequencies, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have stimulated emission, which is also negative. You have excited state absorption, which is positive. And if the molecule forms a photoproduct and doesn't go to its original excited state, you will have some ground state bleach, and you will have some induced absorption that corresponds to the absorption of the product state. And so this is what you want to look at. Basically, the experimental scheme consists of using two uh, uh, short pulses of light. You use a pulsed excitation. Then you let your probe pulse, which is normally as broadband as possible, to look at as many wavelengths as possible, uh, you delay it with respect to the, the first one, and then you disperse the, your probe light with a spectrograph to look at the spectrum, uh, all spectrum at once. You can do it monochromator, it doesn't uh, really matter for the discussion purposes. And you can look at a number of processes, processes such uh, like uh, energy transfer, reaction dynamics, all the relaxation processes in the molecules, proton transfer, electron transfer, everything very very important for, for, the, for the photochemistry uh, that we talked about. You can look at the carrier dyna dynamics in semiconductors and nanostructures. And this is really a bread and butter technique in, in ultra-fast world. The way you do uh, it experimentally, you use uh, an amplified titanium sapphire or, or, or other short, short pulsed laser. Uh, you split the beam. Uh, you send part of the beam through the optical parametric amplifier, which is a device that basically produces the spectrum that you want, to, uh, which matches the absorption of your sample. Uh, so the lasers are generating the light that they are generating, so you cannot change that. But you can use nonlinear optical devices to make tunable wavelengths, and, uh, and LPA is such a device. Uh, here in, in this beam you have a chopper which allows, which keeps blocking and unblocking uh, your uh, pump lights to be able to measure excited sample uh, minus non-excited, yeah? And uh, basically you direct and focus this light into the sample and then you block it. Uh, the rest of the light you send through the delay line again, so basically a variable delay with which this beam can travel that uh, gives you the time resolution. And then you focus this laser light into, into a nonlinear medium where because of this effect uh, uh, with nonlinear dependence of refractive index on the intensity, out of a laser light you get white light. Basically, it, uh, the, the light field is so strong that it generates a lot of new frequencies and it becomes a completely white broadband spectrum at a very short and it retains a very short pulse. And then you focus the white light probe onto the sample and then you use that as your measuring light. 
So uh, by having chopper open and close, you uh, measure the two spectra in transmittance, you divide one by the other, take a logarithm, and that's your difference absorption spectrum. The realistic setup is a bit more complicated than that. Of course, there's many optical components, no need to go into the detail. And let's now look at uh, several conceptual examples. So first of them will be solvation. Uh, that is uh, the process when you excite a molecule happily sitting in a solvent, uh, it will be surrounded by, a solvent by the solvent molecules, and since it has a charge distribution uh, uh, in the molecule, uh, the solvent molecules will orient their dipole moments in such a way that, you know, the minuses are close to the pluses, and the pluses are close to the minuses. Now, when you excite the molecule, the charge distribution changes. The electrons rearrange, they go to the excited state. That means the dipole moment of the molecule changes. I drew it here very... Uh, overemphasized, so to speak, eh? so it's uh, really flipped around. Let's, let's assume that the redistribution of, uh, of the dipole moments is so bad that, that the dipole moment actually flips around. Now, what happens uh, at time zero? The solvent molecules are, are, long, are no long, longer happy. Eh? They are minuses at the minuses and pluses at the pluses, so they repel. And what they do after some time, they rearrange, so they rotate around to have minus next to the plus and plus next to a minus again. Now that, that is a process called solvation. Uh, not salvation, solvation, yes. Uh, and uh, that is the rearrangement of, of the environment to minimize the energy of the, uh, of the molecule inside the envi environment plus the environment. If you look at it in energy level uh, picture, and plot a solvation coordinate, uh, coordinate here versus the uh, energy here. In the ground state, everything sits at the minimum. Now, when you excite your molecule and it absorbs some light, uh, the environment is no longer in equilibrium. Eh? So it energetically is not happy. It's higher than zero, uh, higher than the bottom of the well. So the, mo the system starts to drift towards, uh, towards the energy minimum in the excited state. And now, if you think about what, what does the ground state think about it? Eh? So suppose you were to return back to the ground state. Would the, the environment be happy now? Of course not. It has re rearranged itself for the excited state. So at, when the solvation takes place, you have two effects going on. First, the energy of the excited state is going down. And second, the energy of the ground state is going up. Because suppose you were to return to the ground state, you would no longer be at the optimum. And if you look at the, at the stimulated emission spectrum, which is bas basically measuring the energy gap between ground and excited state, what you will see is that the wavelength uh, corresponding to the stimulated emission will shift to the red. So it will start right next to the, uh, to the uh, absorption spectrum. Uh, in theory, even exactly as the absorption spectrum, it's never like that because you have dielectric component in the rel relaxation, which is uh, instantaneous more or less. But uh, as the solvation takes place, you will see the stimulated emission uh, shifting to the red, while the ground state bleach will stay uh, at, uh, at its original position. Okay, so this is what you can expect, uh, expect a red shift due to solvation if you have molecule in solution. Th the same thing happens in the proteins, by the way. Only protein is a, is a lot more complicated than, than, than a simple solvent. So in protein, you have uh, amino acid groups, with some of which are charged, and they will also move around to accommodate the excited, uh, excited pigment in the protein. Now another, a little bit more complicated example, let's think about the molecule that has one vibration. Uh, so it's a hypothetical molecule, again, very tutorial thing, uh, uh, represented by the same uh, harmonic potential in the ground and the excited state. So we all know, uh, well, at least those of us who have studied rudimentary quantum mechanics, we all know uh, what the uh, harmonic oscillator wave functions look like. And if you have the molecule, that has a vibration uh, in the ground state and in the excited state, what we assume is that uh, basically the equilibrium distance is a bit different in the excited state and the ground state, so this, there's this displacement of the potentials. For the rest, they are the same, the frequency is the same, and so on. And now let's think uh, what happens if you put a short light pulse on this, on this molecule that can vibrate. Now, the short light pulse, uh, due to Fourier transform, short in time, means broad in spectrum, yeah? Uh, it has a, a, a spectrum that is broad. And it will excite the molecules 
coherent, making a coherent superposition of several of these oscillation wave functions. So basically, the, after the excitation with the broadband pulse, you will have a superposition of several of these oscillator states uh, excited together. Now, that will, of course, the center will correspond to the excitation wavelength. And now if you do it very el in an elementary fashion, you say that your excited state wave function is a superposition of, of, uh, of normal wave functions of the harmonic oscillator, just multiplied by a set of coefficients uh, that depend on time, because they should depend on time. Uh, the, uh, yeah, and uh, these are oscillator, uh, oscillator eigenfunctions, and uh, uh, these are time-dependent amplitudes. Yeah, so you, you do a very uh, yeah, textbook example of, of solving uh, Schrodinger equation for this superposition. Uh, and basically, you have time derivatives of these uh, uh, coefficients and the uh, Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator, because that's what we assumed, uh, acting on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on them on the left-hand side. If you multiply it by uh, eigenfunctions with uh, uh, complex conjugates and integrate, what you get is a set of equations for the coefficients A, and that you can solve. On, the, on this side, you have, you have the quantization condition for the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. So these are separable equations, all with uh, time-dependent probabilities, and you can easily solve that uh, getting uh, the exponential behavior oscillation with the vibrational frequencies uh, of these time-dependent probabilities. So basically what you have, you have this uh, superposition of several wave functions uh, prepared by your broadband pulse that are evolving in time according to these formulas, so simply exponential oscillations. If you calculate the, uh, basically the, what the probability distribution looks like, uh, uh, what, what it looks like is like this. So this is a ground and excited state potentials. And if we play uh, how it uh, behaves in time, you have this wave packet. Uh, the, so the co coherent superposition is called the wave packet that is moving back and forth on the excited state, pot uh, excited state potential. It's the same uh, on the ground state, but for the, for the discussion's sake, we, we leave it unaddressed. And now if you are probing it with another laser pulse, that the frequency of which is set here, for example, what you will see in this case is uh, actually at time zero, when the wave packet is here, uh, you, will see, uh, you will be able to see the wave packet. After half a period of the wave packing moving away, your signal will become weaker because the wave packet is not here and it's out of the resonance for this wavelength. And so basically the thing to keep in mind that when you have, when you excite a, a vibrational system, electronic vibrational system with a short laser pulse, what you get is a wave packet motion on the excited state potential and, uh, uh, and uh, it, it will produce oscillations in your, in your pump probe spectrum, in your transient absorption spectrum, and these oscillations will have a, a typical time of a vibrational uh, co coherence, which is uh, fr from the vibrational lines in the spectrum, you can estimate it at, uh, you know, one, two picoseconds, that, that would be a good estimate. And let's keep it in the back of our heads for later, because it will be a part uh, of a lesson uh, after the break. Now, for the uh, for the application of the pump probe spectroscopy, just uh, to show you what it can, wh which questions it can answer, I think I will go through one example and then we can have a break because we have to stop. Uh, um, so we will talk about carotenoids. Carotenoids are lovely molecules that color a lot of things, starting with seeds, fruit, fish, birds, flowers, tomatoes, uh, they all uh, uh, are, uh, you know, colorful pigments of nature. They are in the photosynthetic systems where they actually have two functions. One is collecting the light outside the absorption bands of the chlorophyll because they absorb uh, the green light. Uh, yeah. Well, they, they can actually be a food supplements as well. And that is because of their second function uh, th that was also unraveled in photosynthesis is uh, the fact that they are uh, antioxidants. Antioxidants means that they can uh, quench the excited state of sing singlet oxygen. Oxygen is a triplet uh, in its natural ground state, uh, means uh, it has uh, two electrons facing like this. And, and when you excite it, 
uh, if it takes the excitation out of uh, any molecule that absorbed light and became a triplet state, which, for example, is a chlorophyll in photosynthetic system. It, in fact, the, the triplet yield in chlorophyll is above 50%, 50 which was determined by Sir George Porter, uh, which, uh, whom I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the lecture. And so, basically, chlorophylls can easily become triplet states, and then they can excite oxygen making singlet oxygen, which is uh, an oxidizer that can oxidize almost anything. So basically, uh, singlet oxygen is poison. And this poison is produced in copious quantities in photosynthesis. It's one of the byproducts of photosynthesis. And, well, we use it to breathe, but it's a poison. Eh? So that's uh, uh, wisely used poison can be useful. Eh? It's a homeopathy. Yeah? <laughs> but, uh, but so... Carotenoids have their triplet state that is a little bit below the, the, the excited state of singlet oxygen. And so they can basically take the energy from the oxygen and, uh, and uh, make it uh, harmless again. And th therefore, they are known widely, even in you know, food supplement industry, as powerful antioxidizers. Uh, but for the photosynthesis, it's very important. If the forest uh, on a sunny day would be dead in about 15 minutes if it didn't have any carotenoids. So that's uh, the photoprotection role of, for, for, for the singlet oxygen that, uh, that uh, carotenoids are playing. Now, if we look at the, at the excited state, well, okay, you can find them in carrots, and these molecules are uh, large polyene chains. Uh, well, my professor used to joke that, uh, you know, it has to be elongated molecules because otherwise it would not fit in the carrot. That's, uh, uh, you know, carrots are elongated. It uses a food colorant. Now, what we know about carotenoids is that their absorption in the blue-green uh, spectrum is because of the transition from their ground state to their second excited state. And they have a dark excited state in between. Maybe one, maybe more. We don't know for sure. Uh, that's a matter of the investigation. And now, how do we know this? It turns out if you do a pump probe experiment on a, on a, a typical carotenoid, on beta carotene, what you observe in the, in the initial spectrum, if you look at a stimulated emission wavelength, you see it uh, there for a very, very short time. So 100, maybe 200 femtoseconds, you see the emission, this, this blip the red, in the red curve, the negative blip, but then it disappears. And in the spectrum, you see a little bit of a shoulder here, but it disappears very fast after 100 femtoseconds. And then you see the band appearing here, so the growth of the signal at uh, 550 nanometer, and it's not instantaneous. You can see that the top of this curve is a bit round, showing that it's not appearing instantaneously, it's uh, with a 200 femtosecond delay after the excitation. And and this band shows some internal dynamics, which is probably vibrational relaxation. And only after that, the, the ground state bleach is recovered. So basically, the ground state bleach is recovered within tens of picoseconds. And this is, these signals are, in fact, how we know why uh, we excite carotenoids up to the second excited state. Then they do fast uh, 100 femtosecond relaxation to this dark state, which we can actually observe by its absorption to even higher excited state. And uh, basically, uh, this is how we know uh, that carotenoids uh, can uh, be, uh, well, they, they have more than one excited state. This is why they do not fluoresce. And th that is because their lowest excited state is optically forbidden. You can have no absorption to it, uh, and you can have no fluorescence from it. And uh, I think. This is the time for us to stop. Let's have a break, and then uh, I hope uh, we will meet after the coffee break. Thank you for presentation. We can take a question. There are question. There is a question. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Yes. You had a question? No. Okay. So you had a question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I like to know, uh, in this time regime, uh, from physical point of view, uh, which uh, 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 which mechanic uh, description works? I mean, uh, classical or uh, quantum? Uh, because uh, somewhere you uh, consider an electron as a particle, and uh, somewhere uh, as a quantum system. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, 
in fact, not a very easy one to address. Well, the short answer is, is, is it's always a quantum regime. To describe the bands in the semiconductor, the absorption bands in, in, in the semiconductor, in the molecule, uh, or in the, in the protein, you need quantum mechanics. The problem with it is that uh, already for a carotenoid, uh, and this, this has been since the 70s, with the development of the computers, there's no way of treating everything quantum mechanically. So uh, basically we know it's quantum mechanical, but what we do is, uh, is a set of approximations. So first of them is a, is a quantum dipole approximation. So it's, uh, we approximate all the charges of the molecule in the interaction with the electric field as, as, a, as a single dipole. So basically a, a, a charge, uh, a plus and a minus at some distance, which can then uh, interact with the electric field. Now that is actually very productive, so you can uh, do a lot of quantum mechanical calculations uh, with it, and uh, so uh, basically get a description of your results. But the problem is always the environment. Uh, so if the protein is so big, it, it can easily contain 10,000 atoms. There's no chance you can treat it quantum mechanically, so you either use mixed techniques or you use it as a parameter for your quantum mechanical calculations. So the potential energy surfaces that I draw, they are actually sort of, a, since they are ground and excited state, they are in a way quantum, but there's a continuum of uh, basically state positions depending on how the nuclei and the environment of the molecule uh, is arranged. So that is a, a mixed picture, so to speak, to be able to move forward. It's impossible to treat everything uh, with the Schrodinger equation. I mean, it's possible, but you never get the right answer. So if you want to annoy a quantum chemist, ask him to calculate uh, an absorption spectrum for a simple carotenoid, for example, will never work, I can tell you. <laughs> They're still struggling with it. And uh, so it's, uh, you have to make compromises to move forward. So you, you get a semi phenomenological description. Okay, uh, and by this uh, mixture uh, point of view, uh, theory and uh, experimental uh, results are agree with each other or not? Uh, yes, the the, yeah, you can, uh, depending on the, uh, let's say, on the amount of phenomenological uh, information that you put in your model, you can, uh, we will talk about this a bit, a bit more in the next part, but, uh, but you can get better or worse description for experiment. So if you do it uh, uh, honestly, ab initio, more or less, then you expect to capture qualitative agreement between the experiment and, and, uh, uh, and the modeling. If you want quantitative, then you more and more phenomenological parameters have to go in uh, in description of the environment and the molecule itself. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the interesting uh, talk. I have just a, a short question. Uh, you repre represented uh, the first uh, excited uh, states, the second excited states with the ground state, but I think it, it's just in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Yes. So if we want to resolve the Schrodinger equation and to do ab initio calculation, we have to take account of the uh, reverberational and uh, rotational um, degree frame of, uh, of um, the molecular. So I think um, to compare to the experience, we have to take account of this degree of freedom. Okay, so this is a similar question uh, to the one that has just been asked. It is, uh, I totally agree with you that uh, normally you would uh, do a full raw vibrational, well rotations are not very important, uh, important in this context because normally you are in a condensed phase and uh, so they are so slow that uh, the, all the energies will simply shift out of the window of your experiment. But vibrations, yes, and uh, depending on the, on the, let's say, sophistication of the model and uh, the ability to treat everything uh, uh, let's say, uh, honestly, uh, you have to, and there are the studies where you basically calculate the potential with uh, 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 fully, the, like DFT uh, approach or, or, or even a full ab initio approach. Uh, so, and you basically model your dynamics as the evolution on that potential. 
The problem with it is that, uh, as I said, it, uh, it is very computer time consuming and it's never exact. So you do it honestly, you don't get a good match, uh, but what, what you normally get is a set of approximations in quantum chemistry. And so you do it with this basis and you get this result, you do it with the other basis, you get another result. Neither of them is in complete agreement with the experiment. One works better for vibrational dynamics, the other one uh, works better for the for the environment relaxation and so I think a, a bit more productive way since you have very many degrees of freedom in the environment is to actually take care of them uh, in a sort of uh, mixed regime so to treat them as a buff uh, a set of harmonic oscillators if you want and couple your quantum mechanical system to the bath and then uh, trace over the bath uh, uh, degrees of freedom. And this is sort of the way you can still be able to calculate, uh, to model, and to get good agreement with the experiment. But one thing that I want to emphasize is that you don't even need to do that. I mean, for hand-waving picture, eh? for, for feeling how fast the energy is hopping along the ring, for example, or how fast bacterial rhodopsin is isomerizing. That you can still do uh, just looking at the spectra at the lifetimes, and if you can correlate, uh, let's say, you know from uh, cryo-trapping experiments that pigment is isomerized after you, after you put light on it, you know that the energy of the excited state should go down when it isomerizes. You look at the fluorescence, you see it going down and disappearing eventually you know that it's your fluorescence and you know it's in one picosecond. So that's already the information you did not know before you did the experiment. And so you can, even in, in the purely experimental world, you can still get a lot of ideas about how this molecular machine works without having to calculate it precisely. So that's uh, another thing that I want uh, to stress. So if you have any questions, you can bother Professor Vengris during the coffee break. I just want to stress a little bit about uh, being uh, back after coffee break at 11, even if it will be a shorter time. And uh, I want to ask you to be here uh, at the end of the lecture, because we will have starting with 12.30, the feedback session and closing remarks and we are waiting from you your opinion about this winter college and the proposal for the next winter college. So now let's thank again Professor Van Gries. And coffee